Our gospel reading this morning is from the 10th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. We're going to begin with the 25th verse. It's a story that if you were raised in the church, you have heard this story before. And if you were not raised in the church, you're in for a treat. It's a great story. Luke writes, Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more I spend. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have said that the word is very near to us. We pray that we would hear what you have for us to say. Open our hearts and minds to hear and to learn and then to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of us have heard this story many times. It's one of Jesus' best-known parables. It's been acted out, sung about, and great art has been recreated on its themes Today, I will focus on a person generally not in the center of the picture. I scrutinize the lawyer, the one who stood up to test Jesus, who answered rightly and who pushed beyond Jesus' first response with a follow-up question. Lawyers often get a bum rap. Some people like to quote the line from Shakespeare's Henry VI, First thing, let's kill all the lawyers. The line was written for laughs, and it makes at least some people laugh, a sour grapes kind of laugh, because the reality of who many lawyers are, the location they inhabit in our social lives, is something that people can resent. Lawyers have power. They are educated. Often they are wealthy. Some of them command an hourly fee that seems exorbitant to other people. And they have facility in public speaking. To be a good lawyer, particularly a good trial lawyer, a person has to have a sufficiently strong sense of self that he or she can speak up and challenge and keep coming at the one being questioned. To be a lawyer, at least in Jesus' time, and much of the time in our own, is to be a person of privilege, to be a privileged person. 
people with privilege speak more in public than people without privilege. The lawyer in this story understands his place, his social location as a spot from which he has a right to speak out. The right to test Jesus, to push, even after receiving an answer. The lawyer's privilege makes him the right person to challenge and to criticize, and his privileged status makes it possible for him to gather others around him, to draw a crowd, a group, a faction, others who might be hesitant to become very public about their feelings and thoughts, but who are happy to have the lawyer speak for them. His privilege allows him to speak up without fear or hesitation. Because privilege affords us protection. When we speak from a position of privilege, we are at less risk. We have less to fear than those who have less privilege, less power. Privilege status makes us feel entitled to respect, to a hearing, to our words, having the desired effect. Privilege means that if the lawyer asks a question, he expects an answer. His privilege demands that others listen and respond. It is the lawyer who is heard, whose words are recorded and remembered, even though others might have spoken, all because of privilege. Because of his privilege, the lawyer is remembered. The lawyer speaks the greatest number of words recorded until the parable itself begins. He is like the person in a meeting who speaks the most. Do you all take part in meetings? Oh, of course you do. You're Presbyterians. Now in those meetings, think about it. Who is it who speaks the most? Picture a meeting in which you take part regularly. Who can be counted on to take up most of the verbal space in the room? I know you know the answer to this question. You for sure know if it is not you. And you might know even if it is you. But often we are blind to our own privilege. We don't know how privileged we are, nor how privileged we act. The lawyer in this story was a man of significant privilege, and everything he did was an enactment of the privilege which he took for granted. He might have seen himself as not privileged, but as someone whose years of experience, education, family connections, and status in the community made listening to him something that would be of great benefit to others. He might have understood that he was speaking for many who were too afraid to speak. But he was not afraid, and so it was good that he was available to speak for them. This is how privilege, even blind privilege, works. Now, privilege can be a good thing when something needs to be said that is risky to say. We just celebrated the 4th of July. On the 4th of July in 1776, independence was declared by 13 colonies of England, independence from English rule and from the English king. Have you ever read the Declaration, the Declaration of Independence? Anybody? Okay, a few. I encourage you to read it. It is a beautiful document. It's not long. It's very available online. And printed, it's less than two and a half pages. It was written largely by a man of monumental privilege in his time, Thomas Jefferson, who would go on to become the third president of the US. And it was tweaked and revised by men of like levels of privilege, who would go on to limit voting rights to white male property holders, that is, to people like them. The Declaration of Independence is a beautifully written document, something of which we can all be proud. And it reeks of privilege. 
It demands a hearing. It decries the colonists' lack of voice. It includes rhetoric like, the king has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with these measures. And in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. These are statements of privilege. This is how privileged people talk. It says, you who are over us should comport yourself in ways that we see fit, and if you do not, we will take our marbles and we will go home. Or, more seriously, we will declare our independence and we will make war upon you. Thomas Jefferson and his friends were very privileged people, and so they were the right people to speak to the king. They were less at risk than others would have been. So privilege can be helpful when justice needs to be done, when people are being oppressed. But privilege can also blind us and allow us to understand ourselves as outside the laws that govern others. In the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson wrote, We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. Jefferson wrote, wrote that while not believing it, nor practicing it. As a slaveholder and as someone who fathered many slave children, the equality of all men was a virtue. He elucidated memorably, but did not live. So privilege becomes a two-sided coin. It can allow us to do good or evil. It can allow us to speak up when others cannot in ways that work toward God's desired outcome. And it can allow us to speak in ways that are ironic at best and oppressive on other days. Such is the power of privilege that privileged people can say things that are shocking and outrageous and even untrue at times, and they can get away with it. Yet, we look up to people with privilege. We want to be like them. So when the hero of this story Jesus tells is not the lawyer, but the Samaritan, it must have come as a shock. And we need to reclaim that shocking part of this story. The hero was not the lawyer, despite his education, family connections, wealth, power, and privilege. But the Samaritan, a person with no privilege at all, someone the Jews viewed as lower than the dogs, people that were understood as heretics, blasphemers, people who did not worship the one true God and who worshiped in the wrong way, people who were culturally and religiously different than the norm and so despised, who were suspect, who were seen as the root of all infection and disease, to whom no self-respecting Jew would allow his children to wed, with whom no one who kept kosher would do business. The hero of this story is the Samaritan, who is very clearly persona non grata in Jewish society. In fact, did you notice the lawyer will not even say the word Samaritan because the word would taste nasty on the tongue 
Samaritan. Nice people did not say that word out loud. So why? Why is this horrid subhuman creature the hero of the tale? Why did Jesus construct the story in this way? Why couldn't the lawyer be the hero? Why was it the dirty, gnarly, awful specter of a Samaritan? My friends, we have gathered today at the end of a hard week. Our hearts are heavy today. There has been much blood shed. And this hard week has come at the end of a hard month. We've had four weeks in our country when many, so many, too many, Parents, children, spouses, sisters, brothers, friends have lost those they loved. Killed in a car at a traffic stop while a four-year-old watched from the back seat. Or in front of a convenience store in full view of the man's best friend. Or in the streets, gunned down while patrolling a peaceful protest. Or in a gay nightclub full of people celebrating Latino night. We have had a very hard few weeks. We grieve with those who grieve, and those who grieve are too many. There are too many people grieving this morning. And our grief is given nuance and structure, heft and depth by learning about the lives that have been taken. They are a diverse group with diverse backgrounds, diverse educations, diverse professions, diverse racial and cultural identities, and diverse levels of privilege. As the news cycle continues to churn with nauseating regularity and continues to find more and more details to share about the lives of those who died, and how they died, what do we think of them? Nationally, it is clear we are divided. You know this, right? We are divided. There are those who would say, black lives matter. There are others who would say, blue lives matter. You know what that one means? Blue lives, police matter. And still others would say, all lives matter. I take my belief from God. Everyone who God created is valuable and precious. And we must admit that some whom God has created are accorded less privilege by human standards and some are accorded less. Some are accorded more and some are accorded less. This is true, friends. We know it is true. So we become divided. We, we literally come apart in our response to the killings of black men by police and in our response to the killings of mostly Latino men in a gay nightclub and in our response to the horrible ambush of police officers. And this has to do, at least in part, with our sense of privilege. We accord more privilege and more power and more worth to some people than we do to others. We accord more privilege to the killings of some people than to the killings of others. And as weird as it sounds, we accord more privilege by calling some deaths murders and others we find other terms like shootings or lethal use of force incidents. This is a way of delineating whose life and death matters and whose matters less. We accord more privilege to some people, more worth than we do to others. We do, friends, to our shame and against God's will. 
and in denial of the image of God that God has imprinted on every single person. We do not act as if all lives matter. We do not see them all mattering in the same way. We do not. The lawyer who challenged Jesus did not act as if all lives mattered. He, in fact, did not believe that. He believed that Jewish lives mattered more than Samaritan lives. And with others of his time, he undoubtedly believed that male lives mattered more than female lives. And the lives of educated people mattered more than the lives of uneducated people. And the lives of people with money mattered more than the lives of the poor. And he was wrong. Amen? He was wrong. But here's the problem for us, friends. Are those beliefs that the lawyer held still present among us? Are there places and spaces where these wrong-headed understandings of people and their comparative value can still be heard in our society today? Do these misunderstandings of people and their worth still exist? The hero of the story, according to Jesus, was the person with the least privilege of all. We differ from the lawyer. He came to test Jesus, and we we believe in Jesus and name him Lord and Savior. So we have to wrestle with some questions. What does it mean to follow Jesus in how we view people? What does it mean about who matters? How are we called, like the lawyer was, to show mercy? And what is our responsibility as followers of Jesus at this moment in our nation? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you stand with me as we reaffirm the faith using a part of the Confession of Belhar? We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for his church by his word and his spirit, as he has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. Church of Jesus Christ, this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways in that we love one another, that we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another, that we share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. To the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen.